PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi broadcasting to you live from the Photo Shelter headquarters here in New York City. We have a fantastic webinar with one of my favorite photographers and people. Um, before we get into that, a little housekeeping note. Over to the right of your computer monitor, you should see the GoToWebinar control panel. And from that panel, you can ask us questions as we move along. And we'll do our best to integrate those into uh, the conversation. We're also recording the webinar, and we'll put this up on our blog uh, within the next 24 hours or so at blog.photoshelter.com. So if you're having technical difficulties or you have to go pick up your kid during the course of this webinar, you can always go to the blog and re-watch all of the fun stuff we're talking about today. Let me introduce you to our guest. You know, in this age of the internet and the information age, uh, there are a lot of personalities online and there are a lot of people who uh, by virtue of their social media followings um, uh, have, have become personalities in the photo industry without necessarily having the credentials. Our guest today has every credential you could imagine in terms of photography uh, in a 30 plus uh, career a year career span. He has photographed all over the world, all different types of subjects, uh, is known as not only a great photographer, but a great uh, speaker, educator, um, philanthropist in a lot of ways, dealing with social issues. Um, and I have to say, having known uh, Joe McNally for several years, he's just a really, really great guy. And I'm so pleased to have him uh, on this webinar today. So hello, Joe. How are you doing? Hey, Helen. How are you? Thank you for that gracious introduction that's it's re <laughs> the admiration is returned you know especially you know all you you and all the folks here at photo shelter pulling this together my my hats off to you thank you this this is kind of a a part two of a conversation that we started at photo plus expo in october so i'm kind of thrilled to have a little bit more time uh in a little less noisy setting to talk to you about this uh, but why don't you tell us a little bit about you know your start in photography and and what you've been doing for the past 30 years <laughs> okay. Uh, well, lot of a uh, lot of clicks under the bridge, or you know, uh, it's been a it's been a long time behind the camera. Let's put it that way. I, I started as a as a kid in New York City, and started at the New York Daily News at a very on, inauspicious uh, level in this industry. I was a copy boy at the New York Daily News, which uh, was the lowest rung on the ladder of journalism. I was basically a, a messenger. I moved paper around the office. I went to go get coffee for people, uh, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it is the kind of, New York is a great school of hard knocks, I, I think. It, it teaches you uh, to hang in there, you know, if nothing else, for sure. And, you know, things progressed, you know, not in rapid fashion. You know, any, any, uh, Photography career, I think, has a you know a, a I don't know I guess you could call it marination. You know, you have to kind of hang in there for a while and and let yourself develop and mature and the way you see and the way you react to things. So it it took a while after I came to New York before I really allowed myself the title of being a photographer. Uh, that was given to me courtesy of the New York Daily News firing me uh, <laughs> three years into uh, my tenure there, and I hit the streets and had a couple of cameras and. You know, I, I went to work. I, I tried to make a living, and I started to to do uh, to be employed as what they call a stringer uh, for the wire services in the newspapers: New York Times, UPI, AP, Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, working for literally fifty bucks, seventy-five bucks an assignment. But I was pretty uh, I was pretty hungry, so there was not it was not unusual for for me to knock off three or four of them in a day. You know, uh, do a job for the New York Times in the morning, a job for UPI in the afternoon, and go shoot a ball game for AP that night. You know, and considering I had an apartment on the Upper West Side that was 250 bucks a month, I could actually make a living with a camera. And I looked around and said, "Wow, I guess that's a that's a barrier, that's a boundary that you cross." And you look around and say, "Yes, I, I'm I'm a photographer now." And and what year are we talking about when you went? Freelance as a stringer there. <laughs> then, embarrassingly long time ago, 1978. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, All right. I had an Icon F 
and a, and a Nikon F2 and a couple of lenses and an old Vivitar 283 flash. There might be some folks out there who remember those. And I just went to work. I, I, I didn't want to leave New York. I wanted to stay. I had no, there was no looking back really. I, I just uh, had my ups and downs for sure. Lots of failures. Uh, you know, the school of failure in, in photography is a very important one to go through because it informs your next job and, and hopefully the successful next job. You know, when you, when you crash and burn on certain things, you take lessons from it. We, we talk a lot about the business of photography uh, at Photo Shelter, and I'm, I'm curious how you think the landscape has really changed. What, what were the challenges of being a freelancer in 1978 versus people that you know now, kids right out of school that are trying to become freelancers? Ah, oh, geez, it was, it was, uh, my sympathies go out to young photographers, you know, uh, today trying to uh, launch a career. Uh, it was very simple. It was hard, but it was simple. I'd go, I'd show work. Uh, it was less pressurized, you know, so photo editors would actually see you at that point in time, and you'd show some work, you get a job, hopefully, and if you did a good job, they'd call you back next week. <laughs> and that was the way things went forward. And you'd for the wire services, you know, you'd, you'd shoot a job as a freelancer. You'd bring in, you'd soup your your uh, your triax in the versamat. The photo editor would pick whatever went out on the wire, and they'd give you your sleeve of negatives back, and you walk out the door with your negatives. That was it. Done deal. You know, here's seventy five bucks. We get to use it once. You get your negs back. Thanks. Yeah. You know, and I had a beeper. <laughs> now I thought that was pretty fancy. I thought that was kind of freaky that somebody could call my beeper service and this thing on my hip would go off and I'd find a payphone and I'd call the photo desk and they'd say, can you make it down to, well, there's an accident at Staten Island Ferry, can you get on the subway and make it down there? You know, I, I, I had to, as I, as I tell young photographers now is in this, the simplicity realm, I had to learn how to do one thing well and that was make a good photograph, communicate visually. Now mm -hmm. I think the onus is on young photographers to learn many things. The web, graphic design, video, audio, uh, they have to become almost their own uh, one-person infotainment center, you know. Yeah. They are, are shooting and blogging and tweeting and uh, seeing clients and uh, shooting some video, BTS, and not only is it here's the job but here's how I did the job and there's so many components that it, it's a fierce juggle I think today uh, to make it as a photographer. So you, you, you started in, in news and photojournalism but at some point you really branched out and, and became kind of a, a jack of all trades of photography. How did that evolution occur for you? True enough. I, I, I segued out of uh, into, into color. I, I found my imagination was a very comfortable place for me to live and my imagination had a degree of color to it and truth be told, Alan, I, I never would have made it as a good newspaper photographer, I don't think. You know, that, that's a specialized kind of uh, hardcore tough job to do every day and uh, the news of the day is uh, is an exciting thing to do but I found as I say I, I, I tended to try to uh, express my imagination and in the news realm there's not that much room to do that so I, I found myself gravitating towards color and magazines the transitory or, or, or um, bridge job I guess you would call it I got hired by ABC television as a staff photographer for the network in uh, in 78 or late 78 maybe even 79 uh, and I spent about a year and a half as a staff photographer there and my boss just looked at me and said we should Kodachrome and we like things I was like what <laughs> you, you, you want to run that by me again, big fella? Um, and so I bought a set of Dynalites many years ago. I didn't even know how to plug them in. And I had many failures. Oh, God, thankfully the job was one that expected failure 
and I routinely delivered on that expectation. <laughs> um, the uh, the reason for that was that as a still photographer for a television network, you're always the caboose of the operation. You're never the primary reason anybody's there. So you always have to fight for a position, fight for an angle. You're the last consideration. A director is out there shooting a a, a piece for uh, you know 2020 or something like that, which was a a show I shot a lot of stills for way back in the day, and they're spending you know thousands of dollars a minute, and they've got talent and this and that. So for you to just get in front of their cameras and shoot you know, 10 or 20 stills for 30 seconds or a minute. To them, that's a big deal. You know, so I learned how to fight the battles I needed to fight, um, be versatile, disappear when I had to, step forward when I had to. And I also learned how to use color, and I also used, uh, learned how to use lights. The, um, you know, it, it, it's common for, for older generations to say, you don't, you don't understand history and you know, I've, I've read a lot of things about you and, and how you were so influenced by the old masters, Carl Maidens, Eisenstadt, Gordon Parks, etc. How, mm -hmm. how important do you think it is for younger photographers to study the work of the generations that preceded them? Probably uh, two answers to that, Alan. In a sense, I could say uh, probably not very important. In a certain level, you know, uh, the economics of being a photographer now, uh, does a young photographer need to study the work of Gene Smith or Carl Maidens, you know, uh, given the, the kind of array of, of opportunities or types of jobs that they might encounter, you know, for the web or something, quick hits, things like that, all, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so is it absolutely essential, you know, to the... Uh, to the sustenance of a career, probably not. Is it, I think, important for the photographer's um, maturation and vision? Yes, I do. Uh, I think you have to study the work that's gone before. You have to look at work that inspires you. You have to um, be influenced by it, feel it. It's also revelatory, really, in lots of ways, because you look at some of the excellent work, amazing transformative pictures, historically important pictures that got done back in the day, and you kind of, you're slack-jawed at it, right? Because these photographers were working with, you know, caveman tools compared yeah. to what we have now. And they still did this amazing job of presenting us, you know, the real world in uh, eloquent and powerful terms. So that has has got to be a lesson that any any young photographer should assimilate and make it part of their kind of matrix in terms of the way they approach their job plus you know it's just fun you know uh, beyond whether it has implications for that you're going to be successful on that job or on that day it's just great because it's an emotional release it's almost like taking a shower i go back sometimes and i just sit with ernst haas the creation, his book, The Creation, and, and it reminds me of why I'm a photographer. And that's important. It's nice to feel inspired looking at that great work. I love that. I feel like we're so cynical so, so much of the time that we don't allow ourselves to be inspired anymore. Yeah, I mean, the, the truly uh, inspirational uh, photograph is a very special event, I think. I, I always say in my workshops, and it, I don't think I'm overstating the case. I, you know, I maybe a little dramatic about it because I am a photographer and I love pictures but I always tell people that when you look at a truly great photograph that affects you deeply uh, you're never the same person again your emotional compass has been changed even so slightly you might not even be aware of it at that moment but after viewing that photograph you're never the same again you know we we started talking at the, at the very top about how you do so much more than take pictures nowadays. There's the teaching, there's the writing, there's this, the public speaking, etc. And, and I'm wondering if how, how important is the diversification to your business viability as a photographer and is it necessary to do other things than just take photos nowadays to be a quote professional photographer? I think it's it's important uh, and my frame of reference is you know, uh, I'm probably biased, you know, because that's what we do. We are uh, as diverse as we can be. I, I tell uh, photographers my advice, you know, uh, which may be not apply to them at all, uh, but my advice is to keep lots of lines in the water. Uh, create, a, create a voice apart from your actual shooting, uh, teaching, writing, 
lecturing, blogging, social media. To me, it's all part of the overall picture of being a photographer at this point in time. It's the world we live in. Social media is a very powerful currency. And if you don't need it or if you're not interested in it, fine, more power to you. What we find at the studio is that it's a valuable way of getting out a message uh, to people, to, to interact with people, get opinions, maybe uh, also a little bit of education. When I write my blog, it's oftentimes references times gone by. And I tell the story of a photograph or an experience that I had that a lot of folks react to it because it's not the experience they're having now. So it's interesting for them. Oh wow, I didn't realize that's what you did. You know, the, that you know, when you were shooting a, a 36 exposure roll of Triax at an Olympics, you had to time yourself as the runners went around the track. You know, <laughs> right. because okay, I've got 18 frames left. Can I survive another? Is that enough for the finish? Or I've got 40 seconds before they close in on the finish. Can I rewind my film? And you know, all those strategy things that used to have to be involved with as a as a uh, film photographer when you're shooting this thing that was real, that was palpable, you took it out and put it in your pocket. What do you do with it then? I, I, I chuckle sometimes, you know, because we're very paranoid in the digital age about backing everything up. And I get it. I totally get it. We're, we play the same game. You know, my assistants and I are out in the field like, okay, you back it up on that hard drive and I'll back it up on this one and then I'll put this one in, a, in the bag and then you get on a different airplane or, you know, I mean, whatever, you know, to make sure the work stays safe. And I always say, well, you want anxiety? Try taking an entire two weeks of work for the National Geographic, like 150 rolls of Kodachrome, and putting it in a box in Mumbai, India, and Federal Expressing it back to Washington, D.C., and waiting three days to, to hear whether it got there or not. Right. That's pretty anxiety-producing, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, I can imagine. Why don't we look at some photos uh, Naked Power, Amazing Grace was from, uh, I believe, 1996 Life magazine. Yes, I took the clothes off the Olympic team kind of prior to um, maybe the popularity of having everybody, uh, athletes, get naked in front of the camera. You know, ESPN, the body issue, is a very powerful issue for that magazine, and now athletes are kind of routinely doffing their duds, you know. But this, yeah. this was considered um, a little bit... Uh, unusual, uh, mildly scandalous in some quarters. Life Magazine lost some subscribers over it. I ended up on the Today Show and Good Morning America and people were like, how did you get these people to take their clothes off? I'm like, <laughs> I asked them to, you know. I mean, athletes are very proud of their bodies, you know. Um, if you look at this fencer, I mean, I was going for information here as well. His fencing arm is his right arm. See how much more developed it is than his left arm? Yeah, looking, wow. Look looking for things like that. The right hand side of his body is much more powerful than the left. And I was looking for how uh, an endeavor in a sport, a particular sport, would affect the human body. I'm always really surprised, you know, as we look at this photo of the fencer and here's, uh, is it Gail Devers or? Gail Devers, the fastest woman in the world at the time. It's, it's, it's so surprising that the the different body types because we get so ingrained at seeing these fitness models and thinking that 6% body fat is what every athlete looks like and yet bodies are so specialized based on what they need to do. Absolutely. Um, Gail was an interesting individual to work with. Sprinters, I find, are just like their sport. They're aggressive, they're brash, they're in your face. They're an explosion of personality the same way they're an explosion of energy over 100 meters. And uh, you know, look at those fingernails. Um, you know, and uh, Gail did this for me spontane spontaneously in response to a question. And she just said, well, I'm pretty strong. And she popped her bicep like this. And I shot this picture available light in about 10 minutes. And uh, no great insight on my part. I just asked the question. I was like, I had already photographed her legs and I was happy. And then she said, well, I've got this arm strength too. And that helps me, you know, in my race. I'm like, oh my God, I think I should shoot that. You know, what's, what's left of my synapses after 35 years of being a photographer crackled, you know, and said, Joe, shoot this picture. It ended up um, this picture won first place in the world press for portrait that year, hmm. and it's a it's a ten minute effort um, shot on a on a air, airport runway in Santa Monica, California. So, like many photographers, I you know I the, the, I've shot nudes very few times in 
all the times I've done it, I felt very, very nervous uh, for myself as well as the subject. How, how do you get around that feeling with somebody who's very famous, a high-profile person who has no clothes on? It was actually uh, not that difficult. You know, uh, I've done uh, some nude work over time, and uh, the there couldn't be anything more uh, clinical or professional than a nude photography shoot. Anybody who's fantasizing about, you know, uh, um, you know, smoky studios with, you know, <laughs> you know, naked people running around and all sorts of shenanigans going on is that does not happen. Uh, at least in my experience, you have to be utterly professional. It's always a mixed gender crew. Uh, you always right. have ma males and females in, in on the set with you. As a photographer, I stay off the set until the model is comfortable, completely comfortable with you know he or she, however she, they might be posed. And then I simply walk straight to the camera. I keep my head down. I walk straight to the camera. And really, the only thing I see on the set is what I see through the lens. And I keep it that way because it's absolutely you know you you have a bond of trust with any subject and that bond of trust and also the level of vulnerability ratchets up extremely high when you've asked someone to do something revealing or extremely personal like show their body you know and athletes as I say are pretty brash about it because they're fantastic human specimens and they've worked really hard on their bodies so some of them are like yeah sure man I'm you know, happy to do that I'd love to have that picture for to look back on when I'm 75 you know yeah yeah we have a question in regards to how how important is it to have a controversial set of images to get on the radar of uh, the photographic industry and photo editors and photo buyers nowadays do you think Oh, good question. Good question. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> you know? um, as I always tell people, I did this. I did this story. And I, you know, when I when I shot this stuff, uh, I was a pretty good photographer, and I had shot covers of Life and Time and Newsweek and National Geographic, and you know, uh, my mother cared. <laughs> right, you know, right. but then I took the clothes off some famous people, and oh boy, did I get noticed. It's again, I huh. think, the emphasis uh, in our culture on celebrity or uh, physicality, sexuality, uh, that, that crossroads that all of these uh, themes intersect. I mean, there's nothing more powerful. I mean, look at, you know, Kim Kardashian and break the internet, you know, yep. and all of that stuff. I mean, I think that's kind of gratu gratuitous, but, you know, um, there you have it in a nutshell. Uh, the, uh, that, that if a photographer intersects with a a current theme or vibe or what would you call it zeitgeist I guess you know popular culture and manages to uh, image that in a powerful way that's certainly a, 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 a good way to get noticed uh, elevate your your visibility for sure if you were going to shoot Olympic athletes naked in 2016, how would your approach and how would the final images differ, if any, from these? I probably take the same approach. I'm pretty respectful, you know, of, of the, I'm, I'm very respectful actually of athletes and what they accomplish, especially Olympic athletes. Olympic athletes by and large are not the million dollar, you know, uh, Kobe Bryant's of the world, you know, who are in the public eye all the time. Uh, they have a four year road to travel to a small chance at success you know and that window opens and closes very rapidly so I have a lot of respect for their endeavors so I would probably go about it the same way I might be able to do a few things that are more aggressive because again the the window of what's acceptably publishable in a mainstream magazine has enlarged, right? right. I mean, in, in, in the ESPN body issue, for instance, there's some pretty radical nudity in that, in that issue, yes. uh, which would not have been acceptable in, at Life Magazine 1996. Just, just wouldn't have flown. My, my editor, Dan Okrent, who uh, was a very smart editor and very gifted visually, he looked at me and he said, butts are okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, so I can show somebody's tush. He goes, yep, but no, nothing frontal, man. I can't publish it. I just can't do it. <laughs> so I, I went into the field with that mantra, butts are okay. <laughs> would, you, would you stick with black and white or would you try color? I'd probably stick with black and white. I think the tonalities of black and white as they um, render human uh, skin are just 
wonderful. Yeah, I mean these are these are such great photos, and I, I think about it also in the context of the time. And yeah, as you say, I can see why they would be controversial. Now it's sort of like, oh, okay, well I saw twelve of these on Instagram today. <laughs> well, things have changed. Jackie Joyner, Kersey here. You know the previous picture that we had up earlier. Um, you know Jackie, I had worked with before. She's a very patient, wonderful person, but she was very nervous, and she just didn't want anybody to. You know, she's very conservative person you know and I said Jackie it's gonna be okay and we had a lot of kind of back and forth about what she did with the javelin on her back but you know that picture of Jackie um, is in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington oh, fantastic so I'm glad I hung in there with her so it's talking we're gonna go from these these incredible athletic bodies talking about one of the things we, we, we talk about in private as well Joe which is this issue of aging as a photographer <laughs> and, and how you're lugging these 50 pound lighting cases and you know f you know five pounds of camera but you have three of them on your shoulders how how difficult is it to have kind of a physical job and have to deal with the ailments that come with with aging your knees your back etc um, yeah, you identify a really uh, powerful issue, uh, and I'm definitely an authority on aging as a photographer. <laughs> you know, you've come to the right place here, Alan. Um, when we were kids as photographers, we didn't even think about it, right? Uh, I'd run around all day with a 35-pound donkey bag off of one shoulder. You know, I'm surprised my back isn't, you know, uh, uh, the Pacific Coast Highway, you know. Yeah. Um, and we didn't even think about it. It wasn't an evolved uh, state that we're in now, where we realize the stresses. And so backpacks are the are the way to go, where you balance your load and all that sort of stuff. There's different kinds of camera straps and belt straps, and uh, you know uh, all these evolved apparatus, you know, to keep us uh, keep our cameras with us, etc. I think that's all a good thing. Uh, definitely a good thing because the aging process as it interfaces with photography is not a kind one it's definitely not I've had knee surgery I need two more knee surgeries uh, I've got arthritis um, I have I can feel it I can feel it very powerfully our bags are anywhere from 50 to 75 pounds you know I walk with one or two of them for a while uh, you know up a stairs or into a location I can feel it and I've always been the kind of photographer who's there with my assistants. Uh, if we if we start a set at 6 a.m., I don't come in at 9 a.m. when everything's all set up. You know, yeah. I'm there. Yeah. I'm there with them, and I don't lift what I used to be able to lift, but I am there uh, because I think it's part of the grist of being a photographer to be involved in the physicality of it, to be involved in the evolution of a lighting scenario, because you have to have that eye in the game all the time. That means you have to be there, you have to be present, you have to make adjustments sometimes yourself, because it's difficult to articulate maybe exactly what you're thinking or feeling with the light, and so you. Have to interact physically with all of the stuff of photography, and uh, I've been, you know, I've done crazy things, you know, uh, for the Geographic. They, the Geographic assigned me to shoot major telescopes, you know, which are huge, huge installations on the tops of lonely mountains. I shipped 47 cases to Chile. Yikes! You know, uh, put them on three pickup trucks with one assistant, and drove them out into the Atacama Desert and spent two weeks out there lighting the uh, the very large telescope. This is very physical work, uh, and I, as a young photographer, I'd say you know try to ad try to adapt um, you know a healthy approach to this. You know, uh, stay safe, uh, don't lift beyond your your levels. Stay um, you know do stretching and and yoga or whatever it might be to uh, to just to increase your tenure. You know, uh, because photography is 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 something you do you know it is something you do but it's also something you are if you're a photographer it's part of you so I don't think retirement is necessarily in the cards for many photographers or most photographers certainly not in the cards for me you know I'll put I'll get put in a box with a camera in my hands <laughs> right. and, and um, you know part of that is the precarious nature of the financials of doing this you have to keep working nowadays you have to work harder just to stay in place uh, so longevity is a crucial issue 
for uh, any photographer who took, takes the long-term view of this. We, we've been seeing the camera manufacturers develop some smaller and lighter bodies, the mirrorless systems from, from all the major camera manufacturers, but it doesn't seem like the lighting is getting any lighter. I guess when you have a big battery on it, it just can only be so small. Yeah, the you know the the capa capacitors. I mean, essentially, what powers a lot of location units is the equivalent of a motorcycle battery. And uh, there are have been some evolutions. Uh, there's a new unit out, uh, the B ones, the Profoto B ones. I've been mm -hmm. using a lot. Pack a pretty good wallop, but are very versatile and kind of uh, you know relatively easy to tote around. Uh, but the bigger power packs, if you do need lots of power, they they come with a price, and that price in, involves you know the weight and the you know and also just physically the the shipping of them, getting them places. You know the airlines are pretty restrictive now, so you really have to react in lots of ways. You have to be anticipatory in your photographic business now. One of the the most powerful things that you can get from your client is their uh, their shipping number. You know, um, you know, because if you can anticipate a job in two weeks, the client will love you. If you don't get on an airline and run up a two thousand dollar excess baggage bill, that you work with them and say, okay, we're going to um, be at this location and evolve the job, know what your parameters are, and ship the gear ahead of time as a budgetary consideration. You have to work with your client because everybody is in this now wanting pictures but also wanting to do them as economically as possible. So it makes sense to uh, be very not only participatory in the planning of a job but also anticipate where the costs might arise. I, I wasn't going to bring it up but since we, we started talking about it, gear, I, you know, photographers love their gear. Um, hmm. You mentioned the, the Profoto B1. I know you shoot Nikon like I do. You know the D eight hundred is the is the camera that I'm using, and you have the D eight ten. They're thirty six megapixel cameras. We've yep. seen another camera manufacturer come out with a fifty meg megapixel. It seems like we're kind of back in the megapixel wars again. Do you think thirty six pixels is enough for a DSLR? Oh my God, yes. I mean, I get files out of the D eight ten that just kind of feel like they're going to jump off the computer screen and wrestle me to the ground. So. I've been saying this for a while, and my my firm belief is that we all have enough pixels, um, you know. And and it's interesting, you know. I, I have this conversation with folks at Nikon because I, you know, I do work with them, and I, and they will ask an opinion every once in a while, and I I wonder where all this is going, you know, in, in terms of evolution. How much better can the cameras get? Yeah. Uh, the the advancements I think at this point are going to be somewhat incremental. Uh, better autofocus maybe a little bit uh, maybe a bit more resolution who really needs it uh, the color the the sensitivities the array of tools inside the camera is incredibly well developed uh, you know I, I I could again I, I don't mean to keep referring to my demise you know but I could <laughs> I could stop right now I mean if I if this if the da10 and d4s were the last cameras I owned fine these are fantastic machines. That's that's exactly how I feel, and I'm one tenth the photographer you are. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I've seen your stuff, Alan. You're, you're a good shooter. You're a good shooter. <laughs> um, you know, the 2008 we had the Great Recession. It was tough uh, for freelancers of any stripe. How how did the economic downturn affect your business? And have you ever thought about just throwing in the towel and saying, you know what, this photography thing is too difficult? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, it wasn't in 2008. In 2008, we weathered the storm relatively well, and that, I think, was largely due to the fact that we had diversified, you know, mm -hmm. and I was able to fill in what we were losing in assignments. I was able to fill back in a baby a bit with workshops or, or uh, lecture uh, or try to, uh, to maybe take in some advertising on the blog or, you know, just try to... Uh, look around at other avenues to, uh, you know, keep us afloat as the assigning uh, sector or magazines, our, our staple for many years was receding in the economic picture, uh, made a push to look for more commercial work. Uh, if you could get a big commercial job, that can literally be worth two or three months. One, one day or two days of a commercial job can be worth a couple months of editorial jobs. 
And so if you can snag one of those every once in a while, man, it's helpful to keep yourself going and keep the lights on. Our, our big uh, downturn uh, was after 9-11. Um, the uh, business was not good leading into 2001, and it was non-existent after the events yeah. of 9-11. And uh, we were bankrupt as a studio, completely, totally bankrupt, worse than bankrupt. I, I was, uh, uh, you know, six figures in debt, and Thanks. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see the sun, you know, I didn't see how I would ever come back from that. And um, it was a time where actually my sisters, uh, who were very, I'm very close to, my sister Kathy was worried about me. She took me to a career counselor because <laughs> and, <laughs> and, she was wanting me to do something else, you know. And, you know, I just looked at this dude across the t desk. He's a very nice person, you know. And he didn't know anything about me. I'm like, you know, man. I appreciate your advice, but I'm not going to take any of it, you know, because I am who I am at this point, and I'm going to I'm going to go down swinging somehow, some way, and uh, we just we we um, I don't know exactly how. I mean, Lynn, my longtime studio manager for 22 years, is one of the most wonderful people on earth and she kept us afloat in lots of ways I mean she was like uh, the little Dutch boy running around yeah. plugging holes in, in the leaky the leaky barrier you know and like she'd move you know, pay one credit card and then use funds from another credit card to pay that and then we'd have you know it was it was a hop and skip there for quite a while and I just kept my head down and I kept I kept seeking work and I made the turn into becoming a digital photographer and um, got a job for the geographic uh, which had, geographic had banished me at that point I had some difficulties on a job and so they hadn't they hadn't assigned me for I don't know four years five years mm -hmm. I finally wrote a letter to him and I kinda said look what is the what is the deal can we at least discuss things and um, in their in their fashion they never answered the letter but they gave me a job <laughs> I was more than happy about and it was it turned out to be the first all digital story in the history of the geographic it was a story on aviation and that really marked uh, kind of like a okay all right maybe we can grind it out we've got something here to to chew on and over those time, are great photos by the way Oh, thank you, thank you. It was um, it was a heck of a story to shoot. Um, difficulty as uh, difficulties as they always present themselves in stories, but ultimately uh, a, a rewarding story to be involved in. And I'm very thankful to them for that. Uh, and uh, you know, little by little, it it took. Alan, it probably took me ten years to yeah. actually feel like uh, we had come back where I could look around and breathe. And. Um, <laughs> I just I'm so thankful to my wife Annie for um, being patient during that time. You know, you uh, you have a fascination with dancers, and here was a story that you pitched to Life magazine, and really on your own dime went out to Moscow and and shot it. Can you tell us about the Bolshoi dancers? Yeah, sure. It's 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 tr true. I had this nutty idea, you know, that I was working with a Russian fixer named Igor Malahov, a wonderful guy, and he had a friend who was uh, this lady, actually, uh, Nadia Grachova. She was a prima ballerina with uh, the Bolshoi at the time, and he said he had an acquaintance with her, and I said, no, oh, I'd love to shoot dance, man. That would be fantastic. The Bolshoi. And I went to my editors at Life Magazine, and they were like, yeah, sure, Joe, we're really interested in a story on the ballerinas in Russia. Um, but they tolerated me because I was so passionate about it, and they said, look, don't spend any money. So I went to Russia on my frequent flyer miles. <laughs> um, you know, I was I was working as a staff photographer for Life, which is part of the Time Warner multi-billion-dollar industry, and I bought yeah. my ticket on my frequent flyer miles. Ridiculous. And then, and then I stayed in my in Eager's apartment. He went over and moved in with a friend, and I stayed in his apartment, which was kind of a tenement. And uh, uh, and then we started hammering away at the Bolshoi, and and the uh, business in Russia is wild, right? I went in to meet the um, the economic director of the Bolshoi and he sat down and he says okay yes this is very nice you know do you have a thousand dollars and I looked at him I said uh, what do you mean do I have a thousand dollars he goes yeah thousand dollars 
just just to get the conversation started, something to put in his pocket, <laughs> something for him to feel good about. And I said, you know, I just don't have that kind of cash on me right now. And uh, it was like he just to even allow me near the dancers, he wanted a bribe. And uh, this is the way of things oftentimes, uh, especially at that time in Russia. I haven't worked there for a while, so I can't speak to the nature of it. There's my tenement. There's my apartment. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I had this idea that uh, the cleaning lady is. I, 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 she, we got her. I think it was, uh, uh, might have been Eager's friend's grandmother or something. And we got this lady, and I posed her there, and and then we got one of the dancers to come over. But the one thing that we did was a good thing. We got a couple of dancers to agree to pose outside of the official channels of the Bolshoi. And so Igor and I, there was only one E6 lab in Moscow at the time. We went and we processed the film and then we took and made like big prints, like 11, 14, 16, 20, whatever they were, and we brought them back to the dancers. And we kind of destroyed them from within. Those dancers showed the other dancers the pictures. And pretty soon we had dancers calling us and saying, well, you know, these look interesting pictures. Can, can I pose? And so all of a sudden we had the dancers coming to us. And the doors got opened a bit, you know, because you go there, you go to the Bolshoi and you say, well, I want to buy a ticket. And the box office looks at you and says, oh, we're all sold out. And you go outside and there's a guy with a, uh, his collar turned up and, you know, very large shoulders. And he looks at you and goes, yes, I have tickets, you know. So you buy your tickets right. from the mob, you know. Um, these ladies are, uh, as, as Igor put it, they're rented babushkas. He goes, Joe, I, I have babushkas. <laughs> and I said, I need, I need some old, older ladies, just, you know, very kind of Russian-looking ladies standing there talking, and then I'm just going to improbably have this lovely ballerina do a move. And this is the Arbat. This is a subway station in Moscow. Look how beautiful it is. This That's is a subway incredible. station, you know. Amazing. Just an amazing how, place. How important is these sort of self-assigned projects and personal projects generally – to kind of your mental health and your creative juice flow. Oh, it's 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 absolutely essential, absolutely essential. I'd I'd explode. I'd be like a pressure cooker without a release valve, um, you know, and it wouldn't be pretty. So um, this was basically a self assignment. Life, I brought it back to life, and they ended up running at ten pages. So so much for not wanting the story. They were yeah. like, oh. Oh, wow. Okay. See, I was looking at these dancers as a vehicle to move me through Moscow to take, take a look at Moscow, which was in turmoil at the time. I mean, Russia had just turned itself completely upside down. Uh, Yeltsin, you know, and the, the old guard was gone, and now maybe democracy was taking root. Who knew, you know? I mean, nobody knew about Putin, you know, at, at that time, right. you know, but I was using the dancers to take a look at a very stressed place and how the arts would survive or how the arts would implicate itself into that. And so I started moving the dancers around. I, I took one dancer, that they had taken all the old communist statues, uh, Dzerzhinsky and Stalin and whatnot, and hauled them off to this statue graveyard. So I have a picture in, in the in the uh, series where a ballerina is on point on the head of Dzerzhinsky, who used to be the, the guy who established the KGB. You know, and he's on his he's on his side. He's a toppled statue, and she's on point. You know, so I was trying to take a look at that. You know, at that kind of aspect of things. Do Do you ever uh, get into a creative slump, or do you just have a, a notebook filled with ideas that you just need the time to execute? Well, uh, um, both conditions exist. There are times where I just think, man, I haven't got a good idea in my head, and uh, that's a rough place to be. And I find the best way to get through those is just to keep shooting, keep shoot your way right through it. And even though you might be producing dreck, you know, eventually something will gel and there will be the wind in your sails. You get a creative kind of pulse back. Uh, at the same time, I, I, I am fortunate in that I have a good imagination and there's still lots of things I want to shoot. So I'm, I'm proposing all the time, I'm putting uh, ideas visually together in my head and wondering, and then I kind of shop them around and see if somebody would want to fund them. Like nobody told me to put take these two dancers and bring them to, um, this is the Sanduni Bass, the steam bass, a very famous bath in downtown Moscow. And mm -hmm. uh, nobody told me to do this. And I walked in on these guys and I said, I'm going to be these dancers in here and, and would you guys be part of the picture? And 
Russian people are very vibrant folks. They're very artistically inclined. They're emotional. And the dancer said, yes, we'll do this with you. This is your art. We will participate with you. Hmm. And that's an amazing gift that someone can give you. And then these guys in the steam baths, they are clapping for them. You know, I set this whole thing up. You know, it's one of my favorite pictures from the series. I just improbably in this famous steam bath, you know, which is part of Russian culture, these two dancers are magnificently intertwined. So this is shot on film, and I noticed that your fluorescent overhead lights are perfectly white balanced. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you <laughs> must have been gelling some stuff here. Absolutely. Um, if you notice out the window, it's, it looks a little magenta. Yeah. Um, so I balance for the inside, and the price you pay for that is certain white balances outside will start to go a little pink on you. Uh, in this instance, I shot a two and a quarter camera. I shot a, uh, a Mamiya RZ. Um, no, not an RZ. This was the rangefinder camera, the Mamiya 7, with a 43 millimeter lens, which was a very sharp lens. So I shot this particular situation on a larger format. We have a lot of questions in regards to uh, number one, do you have an agent and uh, how, how important is it for photographers nowadays to have an agent or join an agency? Um, I'm perhaps not the best source for that because I have never had, uh, there's a difference actually between agents and reps. I've never had a successful kind of uh, stint with a commercial rep, uh, just hasn't worked out necessarily. Uh, for me, my relationships have always been direct. In the day, in the editorial game, um, an, an agent was a very positive thing to have. I, I was with a number of agencies, uh, Sigma, uh, Camera 5. They would, uh, the way it worked, Alan, was that uh, you would shoot a job for a magazine. The rights would all revert to you. And then you would give that block of film to your agent who would then package it and then resell it around the world. And if it was a really good story, the, you could make a fair amount of money in syndication. So you accepted the fact that you were only making maybe 500 bucks a day as a photographer. But then your agent would wrap up that story and sell it as an exclusive, a countrywide exclusive in Europe. So, uh, you know, Bunta and Stern would compete for it. And you'd get a good price from Germany. You'd get a good price from the UK, France. Italy, you know, and so you'd sell to these major magazines in Europe and get a country exclusive for each of those magazines. Mm -hmm. So if you had a good story, you could easily make an additional forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in syndication, which more than made up for the fact that you weren't making very good money to actually shoot the story. Right. That was the way it worked. But now, of course, and a geographic, of course, was a very powerful story to put on the marketplace as something generated like that but now the National Geographic I think they have 23 international editions so in, um, stories with the internet now are immediately migrated worldwide so the resale potential of a story has gone considerably down uh, mm. so that but so I don't know the importance of an agent right now um, there are smaller agencies that are doing great work, Aurora, um, Polaris, uh, they, and some of the big agencies, agents, you know, AFP, um, you know, Getty, they have very, you know, very talented photographers. And they, those photographers, I'm going to have to assume, uh, find real value in the agency association. But I don't know exactly how it works uh, so well anymore. A lot of those photographers are, you know, some of the um, uh, relationships at Getty or staff. You know, I know Larry Busaka, for instance, is a very fine photographer. He's the chief photographer at Getty Entertainment and uh, he has a very powerful relationship. So there's a lot of photographers so I think the agency path works well. Uh, but it has changed considerably. We're getting a lot of questions about how important is assisting to a photographic career and how does one become Joe McNally's assistant? Hmm. Um, uh, good questions, both. Uh, in fact, I see a couple. There was a name. I'm going to take a split second here to say a personal shout out. I saw Mike Sakis' name come up from Hong Kong. Hey, Sakis, how you doing? <laughs> um, he he has worked with me on a number of jobs. He, we met in Santa Fe in the workshops. Good good young photographer out in based in Hong Kong now. Um, for those starting off, it it depends on your path. Um, when I got out of school at the Syracuse University photojournalism program, 
we were really vectored into becoming newspaper photographers. That was kind of the goal. A lot of photographers who were graduating at the time like segued into the newspaper field and the newspaper field assimilated them because newspapers were still very vibrant and there was lots of them. That's not a path that's, that's often open so well anymore. Uh, and newspapers training is still to me the best training you can get as a photographer to become versatile and know how to tell a story and tell a story quickly. Uh, the National Geographic, for instance, has mined newspaper photographers over the years. David Allen Harvey, uh, Chris Johns, uh, Jim Richardson, uh, uh, people like that all came out of newspapers. So it's a very powerful thing to do, but it's also not all that available anymore. So assisting is becoming or has become a, also a very viable path. There's dangers to assisting you get comfortable as an assistant or you work so hard for another photographer you don't find the time to work on your own stuff. Those are pitfalls of assisting. But it also is a very, very smart thing to do because if you assist a successful photographer or someone who's, who's in the mix, they can acquaint you with potential clients. They can teach you not only uh, how to light but also how to bill and how mm -hmm, to manage mm -hmm. a business, which is very, very important. You know, uh, my studio manager, Lynn, whenever assistants come in to work with us, I always tell them, you'll learn as much from Lynn as you will from me. A good example of someone who kind of, quote unquote, graduated from our studio is Drew Gurian, yep. who is, uh, you know, very young photographer and quite successful in his early, I guess he's gone now two years, something like that. He's been very successful uh, and he's chipping away at the rock and roll scene. He, music has always been very important to him. So, he, and he walked out of my studio with a, with a set of contacts and being something of a known entity in the industry and that has certainly helped him. So assisting is definitely uh, a good way to go in this, at this point in time. What I look for in an assistant is, you mentioned two words here, they're assistant and team. That's what we are at the studio. We're a tiny little team. Everybody works together. Everybody pulls their weight. We just don't have, you know, we're a small, small operation. And uh, we're definitely a seat of the pants. So nothing is too big, nothing is too small. To be part of that team effectively, the best thing you can bring is not so much technical skill, because we can teach you that, but it's attitude. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just the ability to just hang in there out in the field, work hard, accept the fact that the hotel room's kind of crappy, and, <laughs> you know, we got to get up at 4 a.m., and we have to get up at 4 a.m. for the next five days in a row, um, and just get with it, understand it. Uh, there are people who get into this business, uh, uh, you know, I've had hundreds of assistants work for me over the years. And some are excellent, and man, they're worth their weight in gold. A lot of them are kind of sort of in a middle group, and then there's the occasional folks who get into the business for the wrong reasons. Yeah, they they think it's first class air tickets and beautiful fashion models, or maybe they have connections in the field and they know a couple of powerful picture editors, and they think, well, those folks will just grease the skids for me. That's erroneous. Any point in time that you are involved in this business, it's a fight, and you have to. Uh, work incredibly hard. You have to bring certainly visual skills, but you have to bring a ferocious work ethic to this. Uh, and you have to stay with it. And you have to weather disappointment. You have to have a resilient personality so that you don't take rejection on an intensely personal level. You know, if someone tells you your pictures suck, well, get used to it because a lot of people will tell you that over time. Yeah. So um, that's the kind of resilient person that would be a successful assistant and ultimately a successful photographer. I, I want to end uh, with a project, uh, your Faces of Ground Zero, which I know was one of your most personal projects, um, shot on large format Polaroid. Can you tell us a little bit about why you, you, you bothered to do this what, what has turned out to be a, a labor of love and kind of continues on to this day. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of Faces of Ground Zero. Sure. Um, well, as, you know, again, a personal side, you and I have a, have a connection here because I still remember the pictures you showed me of that day from, yeah. your shot from your apartment. It's a, you know, it was a day, it was, a, it was seared into everyone's brain. 
you know, I guess maybe even more so if you were in New York. And um, I had used the world's only giant Polaroid camera once prior to the events of 9-11, and I had photographed a dancer, Jenny Ringer, a uh, beautiful dancer, and, and I didn't have any reason to, f to photograph with the camera. I was doing a story about the camera for National Geographic, actually. And uh, I wanted to use it, <laughs> you know, and they, they wouldn't fund it. And Geographic was like, no, because every shot you make at that time, anyway, with that camera was 300 bucks. You know, one frame, $300. And I was like, I'm going to use this camera. So I took my own money, which I didn't have much of, and um, I funded a day. Jenny graciously came down and posed with some costumes. Phenomenal dancer. And uh, we shot seven giant Polaroids in one day of Jenny. And uh, 2100 bucks. There you go. Yeah. Um, and so I had that experience tucked, to tucked away when 9-11 happened. Uh, I don't want to go on too long here, but uh, the camera occurred to me as a potentially appropriate instrument in the aftermath of 9-11 because it has stature, it's an amalgam, or, or it was an amalgam of um, modern Polaroid technology and sort of age-old camera principles. You have to work camera obscura, uh, you have to focus your subject, you cannot focus the camera, all those things. And the print, the positive image that would be rendered was 40 inches by 80 inches, life-size. And so the amazing thing was that 90 seconds after you'd make the exposure, you'd peel the backing inside the camera. The camera's the size of a one-car garage. So there's two technicians working inside while I was outside addressing the subject. And you'd open up the camera door, and they'd peel the back off of this thing, and there'd be this life-size person. And we, it was amazing because it was such a stressful emotional time. We had... You know, I'd say that was part of the fun of it. I'd say to my subject, you want to come into the camera and see your picture? And they'd be, like, yeah. And so we had tough guys, I mean, firefighters, cops, look at themselves life size on the floor and go to pieces. There was a connection or something. They'd be there in their battered, dusty bunker gear and they'd just look and they'd start to cry, you know? And it was just that kind of a uh, time and uh, I was very fortunate to meet the people that I did the camera and my efforts stood in service to their efforts and I, I had a very small piece of the puzzle of that time and I was glad to just um, offer that up as as whatever photographs could be worth at that moment um, I was uh, I was privileged to be a as I say just a tiny part of it I, I guess I I, I want to understand, you know, a lot of photographers ran down there and some were able to gain access and whatnot and everyone had their own personal motivation. For you to go down and spend your own money and incur debt uh, creating and maintaining the project, why? Why, why bother? Well, uh, you know, I, I was in, I, I, you know, the, the original use of the camera I, I funded, but... But I did get funding from Time Warner for the actual project. Um, I didn't take a fee during that time. We threw all the money at the camera because the camera, you got to feed that camera. Yeah. Uh, so I went to John Huey, who was the editorial director at uh, Time Warner at the time, and I knew him. I'd shot for the magazines for many years, and he's an old southern newspaper man, smart as a whip. And he, he looked at me, and I guess he heard something in my voice, and he said, all right. I asked him for $100,000. And he said, all right, you know, you go and you start this. And uh, the last cautionary note he offered to me as I left his office, he goes, Joe, he goes, you spend $25,000 and get me no pitches, that's okay. You spend $100,000 and get me no pitches, we got a problem. <laughs> so, so you can spend just about twenty five grand almost getting set up in the polar polar camera, you know, just in the very first iterations. I had no idea if this thing would work. But I, I, you know, I was all in, you know, uh, I was all in. And there was no turning back at that point. We took the money, we went into the camera, and then the only picture I had was of Jenny uh, as a ballerina. And I went over to, um, uh, I went over to Ladder 9, Engine 33 on Great Jones Street. And I rolled out the picture of Jenny on the firehouse floor. And the guys looked at it and said, hmm. <laughs> You know, I won't include their commentary. Um, yeah. 
Um, but about an hour and a half later, there was a, a rap of a Halligan on the steel door of the studio, and they rolled the truck around. They said, you know, this is where you're shooting the pictures? And I said, yeah. And I told them that some money would go to charity, and some money did, almost $2 million, and the, the project contributed uh, to, or assisted in the raising of uh, uh, nearly $2 million. And uh, they posed for their pictures. John Baldessari, who's now the lieutenant there, was the very first firefighter to step in front of the camera. And because of that vote of faith that they placed in the project, um, every 9-11 morning since then, I've been at uh, Ladder 9, Engine 33. I just, I just stand to the side and I offer my respects. And uh, that's important to them. I think uh, continuity is, uh, as, is important as a photographer. I think the agreement, the unspoken agreement you have with your subjects is emotionally powerful. You, um, by them getting in front of your camera, you have a bond, and that is uh, a powerful one, at least on occasion. And and tell us what has become of these the actual prints of uh, of of these these people. They're in museum quality storage, Alan. They're, they are in uh, a warehouse in New Jersey, and they're about uh, the frames are three hundred pounds a piece. So we're looking at. Um, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 crates, 24,000 pounds, something like that. And they need to be protected, so they're in museum quality storage, which is, uh, that also was a, uh, occasionally a tough thing, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, to manage on a monthly basis to pay for that. Um, and thankfully, I've had some supporters. Photo Shelter uh, has supported the effort, which I'm very proud to say. And uh, you're looking at uh, Archbishop Demetrios, the Greek Orthodox Church, stepped forward and uh, uh, purchased his print, which was wonderful on their part, and they have it, in turn donated it to the 9-11 Museum. And we are working currently with the 9-11 Museum to see if they can make some more acquisitions. All of that is uh, helpful in terms of the maintenance of this, uh, of this document. It's just, you know, it's amazing to, to look at this photography, you know, it's been, gosh, it's been almost 14 years now, and, and yet it's still very, very powerful, um, you know, for, to look at this stuff. Really, really amazing set of work. Well, the people who came to the camera, I think they really felt uh, a need to tell their story. And, and be part of something. Everybody was fishing around for how do we react emotionally to this. Nothing yeah. like this had ever happened. And so this was just a small way uh, uh, for them to share their stories. And as I said, what, what we tried to do at the studio is just stand in service to that. And we made this studio as welcoming a place as we could. You know, we had coffee and stuff like that. If people wanted to hang out, they could hang out. If people just wanted to have a picture taken, they could come in and do that and leave. The beauty of of the expense of every frame was that I was able to. <laughs> this is this was a revelation for me as a photographer. I could finally be honest with somebody when they asked me how long is this going to take. I could li <laughs> literally look at them and say five minutes, <laughs> right. and actually not be lying to them. You know, because you're always like, oh, well, just one more. Oh, hey, just one more. I couldn't do just one more with the giant Polaroid camera. Almost the entire exhibit was one frame. Yeah, and there's no post production or anything. It's just peel the back and there you go. That's it. Done deal. The only uh, person I, I went to four Polaroids with one person, Jason Cascone, who uh, at that time was a probationary firefighter whose first day on the job was 9-11. Nice. He, he was given last rites and they put him on a bus. And he was just, the first three frames, he was just kind of kind of wild-eyed. It was still kind of, and his fellow firefighters, of course, he was a probie. They were giving him a ton of grief about it. And finally, I got a good usable Polaroid of him on the last one, the fourth one. And Jason and I are in touch to this day. He's now Captain Cascone. He's the youngest captain, I think, in the history of 9-11. Mm. And uh, he is in charge of an area uh, that encompasses 10 House down by the trade centers. And here's the relationships you build. Aaron, Aaron Burns, who's the chauffeur on Truck 10, called me up. And he said, look, I was talking to Captain Cascone, and your name came up. I'm a photographer, and 
we just got two new rigs and the guys in the house want me to shoot a postcard of the rigs. Can you help me with that? And so we said, yeah, we'll come down now. So we brought out the rigs, we lit them up, and now it's a, it's a postcard for, for Ten House. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, so relationships, that's what this business is all about. It's not about the pixels. Well, I can't think of a better way to end uh, this really insightful, informing, and, and, and thoughtful hour with you than, than looking at this work, um, a very, very you know, self-assigned personal project that became this huge thing that benefited a lot of people. Uh, Joe McNally, thank you, thank you so much for spending the, the, the afternoon with us here. Oh, Lord, thank you, Alan. Thank you and your whole team at Photo Shelter. It's been a, a wonderful you know, chance to just talk about pictures. Well, Joe McNally is going to be at WPPI if you're a wedding photographer in Las Vegas, uh, I think in March, at the end of March. And uh, another pair that you might have seen before uh, will be our guests on our next webinar, Justin and Mary, as they're known, Justin and Mary Morantz. Uh, so if you're into uh, building your wedding photography brand, please join us for that on March 12th. More details to follow uh, in a webinar sponsored by Tamron. Um, but Joe McNally, thank you once again. Uh, for those of you who are listening, this will be available on our blog as a recording as well at blog.photoshelter.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.